Welcome to Lithium Ion Rock, Season 1, Episode 7, Like a Rockwood Lithium. We have two guests today. One is a man that one of the world's leading lithium experts has said you should listen to everything he says, Garrett Lithium Fueling. We also have Tim McKenna, a former colleague of Garrett's, who was the VP of Business Development and Investor and Government Relations at Rockwood, before taking a similar role at Lithium X through early last year and has recently joined Piedmont Lithium in that same government and investor and public relations role. We'd like to hear, Garrett, uh, you know, a bit about your background. You are uh, ex-Rockwood and you were based in Asia, I understand, responsible for you know, over $200 million in revenue at Rockwood you know, up through... Uh, 2015, which was uh, a number of months after Albemarle, you know, acquired the business. So w- why don't you tell us just a little bit more about your background, what you're doing? Uh, I know you're an independent consultant and you do expert calls with hedge funds and consult the companies, et cetera. But uh, give us a little bit more color on, on, on that. And then we'll go into lithium specific uh, discussion. A mining engineer, been working for Rockwood and its predecessor Chemital for 28 years, setting up the lithium business in Asia. At the end of my career with the company in Rockwood, uh, I've been in charge of the uh, Asian business again from 2011 to 2015, and with the task to redirect the business set up to, from technical grade applications towards battery grade, uh, towards all the battery business. Albemarle, how you view their business at the time of the acquisition and how you view the strategy implemented since then? The last two years uh, or the last year and a half and two, they have adopted basically uh, the strategy we have started at Rockwood. So when we set up uh, the company to grow in the lithium business anticipating the electric vehicle markets and this was in 2010 to 11 uh, the task was always um, to acquire additional resources like telism which we did so in the beginning not successful so at the end we only ended up with 50 percent but uh, also with a plan to acquire further uh, resources. Because if you are in an emerging market and you need to grow uh, over the long run, 5, 10, 15 years, you need additional resources being able to to be developed later on so that you can grow. And uh, if you only have the Atacama, would have the Atacama or or just a single uh, mine like, uh, let's say, Pilbara, then you may extend the production in that single mine, but you cannot really grow uh, according to the, what the market is doing, so 20 30% per year. And uh, I think Albemarle is pursuing the strategy well. Whether Wojina is the right acquisition is a different question, but uh, it fits into the long-term strategy that you need additional resources. SQM, so they also diversified. Okay, they, they gave up the, the LAC brine project in Argentina, but they diversified into Kidman, Mount Holland project. And um, Ganfeng is also acquiring, or maybe with a different, uh, on a different path, uh, additional resources by off-take agreements, but also by, by acquiring stakes in those projects. So all the three are basically uh, diversifying their their resource. TNC, in my opinion, does not fit well into this because the acquisition, in my opinion, of uh, of a percentage of SQM uh, without having say and uh, no access to the to the to the product, and in that sense, doesn't make too much sense to me. Livent is uh, restricted. So if you only have uh, the operation at Hombre Muerto in Argentina, they, the growth is limited. So they can maybe double the production and that's it. Uh, so they will have to acquire further uh, resources. I think you have mentioned this, uh, Howard, in one of your podcasts. 
Your thoughts on, uh, on, on one of the biggest growth areas, which has been Argentina. Your thoughts on brands there? Whether it's brine or whether it's hard rock. So lithium, first of all, is a chemical business. So we are not talking about a typical mining business. You have to make sure that you manage your brine operations in a way that constancy is uh, the case so that you get a constant input into your conversion plant. For sure, when Cyprus, AMAC, Cyprus was at that time uh, in the 70s, started to evaluate the brine operations, Aside from the one they had in uh, Nevada, uh, which is called Solar Peak, um, they went to South America and basically uh, had a look at, at all all those locations. And finally, they decided uh, for the, this. They, they took a decision to buy these lands where Albemarle these days is operating. So this plot or this uh, resource over there belongs to Albemarle. It's not like SQM rented yeah, or leased. Um, and they did it on purpose. They did it on a chemical purpose. So this operation there yields a brine, uh, which is, in parentheses, relatively easy to process. And the whole evaporation process is a co- concentration process, is... Um, uh, basically a chemical purification as well. And uh, what you do is you get rid of a lot of uh, sodium chloride, uh, magnesium chloride, and all type of other impurities. And at the end of the day, 18 months or something, you have a 6% concentrate, which you are treating the plant. In Argentina, due to the altitudes and the weather patterns, you don't reach 6%, maybe 1, 1%. And uh, this means you have uh, less time and uh, yeah, less chances to, to get uh, certain impurities out. And you have to do this in, a, in the chemical conversion plant. And this can't be if, uh, remember, uh, maybe these days is not so, not so much emphasized anymore, but in the past, in the past years, four, three, four, five years, all these junior miners came up and uh, stipulating, oh, we can do it cheaper than the guys in the Atacama. I mean, this is utter nonsense. Uh, that would mean that the incumbents, be it SQM or Foot, uh, Rockwood, uh, now Albemarle, would be idiots and, and wouldn't know what they do. No, that's not that simple. It does not mean that you can't uh, uh, operate in Argentina, but if you want to do it well, and I think the technical process is well founded. So they they went to Hombre Muerto and did not copy the Atacama technology, but uh, develop a new technology which yields a good product. And they did it on purpose because they knew that you can't paste and copy this, what, what you do in the Atacama. And if you do this, you, you will have uh, difficulties in getting a right product. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, Argentina will be more expensive. Uh, maybe on the same range, probably depends on, on Salah, as you will be with hard rock from spot you mean. But okay, the, the cost comparison here depends a bit on whether you are integrated or not in the case of hard rock. So it's not either or, uh, good or bad. It's, yeah, you need Argentina anyway. But uh, they will have a different cost uh, perspective. On the industry cost curve, everybody believes he's uh, on, on the lowest end. We are in an emerging market. And if we think that the market can grow to, let's, yeah, assuming 2030, 2035, the market can grow to 1 million or 2 million, uh, you need all of these projects to be successful even those which are at the very right of the industry cost curve. So having costs of 9 to $10, uh, which is probably the case for lepidolite in China, are more difficult to process. And not only the, the low-cost ones, which are moving in the range of 4 5 6 $7 in operating costs or cash costs. It's not this or that, it's and. I think there has been a bit of confusion in the past of junior miners pushing too much a story which at the end of the day is not consistent with, uh, with the reality they face. The reason for investing in lithium, I guess, has always been if demand is so high and it exceeds 
supply growth, then the marginal cost of production will be on the right-hand side of the cost curve. And if you can successfully produce on the left-hand side, then there's a spectacular EBITDA margin to be earned. I guess the trick is, as you say, is sifting the chafe from the wheat to decide who will fall into that left-hand side realistically. Yeah, but if you are on the left-hand side, you, that's what we explained to our, our customers. So when, when I remember well when four or five years ago I went for the first, with the price increases. So the first ones we did in 2012 or 2011, no? and customers said, your margins are way too high because they saw the published industry cost curves, which put us at, I don't know, two or three dollars or something, and then the prices went up to six. Oh, too much margin in Korea. You can't imagine these guys, no? And I said, yeah, but we need these margins in order to keep developing and financing new investments. Uh, if you don't have these margins, and I think the minimum you need is 20% EBIT margin. I'm not talking EBITDA margin, but EBIT margin. 20% is the minimum you need in order to keep growing. If you don't have these margins, how, do you go, how are you going to finance it? By debt. It's, nobody's giving you that money. So this was difficult to to explain uh, to, to cathode manufacturers or battery manufacturers at that time. Uh, I think slowly people start to understand that without uh, proper margins, you, you, you won't do this. Uh, of, of course, when you go down the timeline, then the resources with those uh, big high margins, uh, of course, are attractive. Hmm? Because you can really make money. You know? This always considers that finally you reach saturation of the market, and then, of course, those guys on the left side are making the biggest money. In, in Chile, you've got enormous reserves, but production just not marrying that. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the reality between you know, the reserves and what's actually possible to produce in, in Chile? SQM can certainly produce the numbers they have published. So technically, 180,000 tons for them is not an issue uh, from the pumping permits. Yeah. So they have, uh, I don't know, 1,500, 1,700 liters per, per second pumping permits, and uh, this is enough. They would have rearranged the run or reading of, uh, of their ponds uh, and on top of this have to build uh, the conversion plant. That's a different story. But the reserve is big, but you, um, the, the output, uh, you can't uh, increase the pumping rate endlessly because you would dry out the reservoir. Each of these reservoirs due to the capillary forces, has a certain flow rate. And if you exceed this, you, you dry it, you dry it out. And once it's dry, it's not going to refill again. That is different from hard rock, where you can go and accelerate your, your output. You, know, you, you put another concentrator and um, you, make, uh, you take off the overburden and then uh, dig a bit faster. This is, in brine operations, not possible. So there is a limit to that. And this is, will be the case also in, 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 in Argentina or in Bolivia, if Bolivia ever comes to, to production. In addition to this, you have to monitor, this came to the, the freshwater and then the lakes around, so the other things, uh, monitoring wells uh, on, on aquifers so that you don't damage freshwater reservoirs which are needed by people living there. So this might be less of an issue in, in, in some parts of Argentina. But at the end of the day, they face the same issues in pumping uh, with the, like, like, uh, like in, in the Atacama. Uh, on top of this, you have to make sure that, and that's going to be interesting if you go to areas where uh, two companies or three companies share or are sitting on the same salt lake or salar. Um, you have to make sure that you don't, uh, that you have no, no interferences on, on each other, like in oil, like in the oil industry. And so you have oil fields here and there and companies, uh, digging from, from different, uh, sides. Uh, you have to make sure that you don't infringe the other guy's rights. So it's going to be interesting to see whether and how this works on the long run. But there is a limit to this, no? to the maximum output uh, versus the, the, the total reservoir in response to your comment that even you know high cost you know nine dollar ten dollar lapidolite projects might need to get built to meet this supply uh, i've understood that there's it's not such a steep cost curve 
uh, anymore. It, it's more flat, certainly with Chilean royalties, but uh, also you're suggesting Argentine assets are are higher cost. If the world needs all of these projects, it sounds like you're saying, they're going to be higher CapEx than the juniors are saying, and they're probably going to be higher OpEx, but nevertheless, they need to get built. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, okay. it so, is. It's, it's a simple math. I mean, if you take the, the potential expansion in Atacama and all the low-cost things, you won't end up uh, at, the, at the numbers you need. And you're saying you need at least 20% EBIT margins. I think I saw in one of your LinkedIn posts mm-hmm. suggesting a minimum of 30% from an EBITDA perspective. The Albemarle Investor Day two years ago, I asked both Luke Kissam there and John Mitchell, who was there at the time, how they assess projects. And, and they said, I think it was John Mitchell who said, you know, something needs a 20-year mine life at 20,000 tons. It's kind of like in the gold business, if you're a million ounces, 100,000 uh, ounces for 10 years, mm-hmm. that's a project threshold uh, as a starting point to, worth doing. Do you agree with that? I agree with that. Albemarle or their predecessor, Ford, they never started with 20,000 tons. We were building up at that time over the over over decades uh, from, I think they started with 5,000 tons, added uh, 10, 15, 20. So it turned out that the maximum feasible to operate is something like 20, 25,000 tons. Plants get larger, the complexity is too high, and the chemical process is, is difficult to manage. You have to keep this, uh, this number. So 20,000 tons over 20 years is a good number. A lot of the you know, feasibility studies we see out of the brines and elsewhere are, are suggesting kind of 15000 to ten twenty thousand dollars $20,000 capital intensity. If you look at Albemarle's purchase and then capital expenditure expectation on Wajina, you know, the number is $40,000 uh, per ton. And if you assume that Namaska gets funded and the 375 Canadian is all they need, that would be $33,000 or so capital intensity per hydroxide ton. But what is the new norm? $40,000 per ton, uh, CapEx does not scare me. Because if the life of mine and the OPEX are within a reasonable range and you stay on on the industry cost curve, not at the far right, but uh, somewhere in, bef- in between, uh, why not? So um, it would be de- can be depreciated uh, over time. And, um, and as long as the demand line, and we expect this basically with the, uh, with the introduction or uh, further uh, introduction of EVs and penetration rates of EVs uh, up to 2030, 2040, then as long as this line is moving to the to the right, uh, then Albemarle is also able to absorb higher cost, uh, not only to do this, but to grow and still retain reasonable margins. Uh, and those should be basically in line with their f- fellow uh, lithium guys. So that's my view on, on, on those things. And as long as you haven't seen any... Uh, uh, evaluation of the the ore body or an NI forty three one hundred one or jock evaluation or something like this, which so far I think hasn't been published, it's relatively difficult to judge whether this Wajina uh, investment uh, is feasible on the long run. But from the from the potential uh, on what is known so far, it could be. That's right. I don't think we're going to see a uh, Jork or 43101 report because neither Mineral Resources nor Albemarle has to do that as a, a larger company. What I do think, though, is that you do have benchmark costs at Pilgangora, both Altura yeah. and Pilbara and Mount Marion and the experience that Mineral Resources has there. So, I mean, if they could get a 300, 350, you know, to be conservative, spodumene production cost, that's reasonably predictable. The cost of the chemical plant up in the Pilbara compared to Kemerton or Quinana uh, is another story, but it's it's likely to be higher cost, in, in my opinion. Going back to the earlier segment where we said 20,000 um, – 
tons for 20 years as a viable project, right. but we didn't really discuss you know, capital intensity for a project mm-hmm. that size versus a project Wajina size. So mm-hmm. would you feel comfortable with a $40,000 per ton capital intensity, 20,000 ton, 20 year mine life project? Uh, why not? Uh, so prices will have to be in the range of uh, maybe between 12 and $16 and uh, probably it's going to be uh, on the higher side, so on the $15, $16, $17 range. And in that case, uh, even if you have higher uh, capex and higher opex, uh, you still can retain your, 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 what we said earlier, your EBIT margins or EBITDA margin of uh, 20, 30, uh, 30%, which are required to, to keep uh, investing further. Garrett, I think you just made major news there with a long-term price forecast uh, in potentially with the 15 to $17 mm-hmm. range. It, it, it just want to clarify, is that, uh, you know, that, that, that is quite a bit higher than, than, than some others. Do you believe that that's it, likely? It, uh, if you have a range from 12 to 16 and uh, you go on the timeline, you have to phase in step-by-step step higher cost operations, then uh, this range is going to move to a, to a, has to move to a, to a higher price. It's not going probably not going to jump unless you have a shortage or a very very tight market. But um, I, I believe that uh, with the phasing in of, of higher higher opex and higher and, and larger capex projects, that that you will see prices moving up to 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 that range. So when I say twelve to between twelve and fifteen or twelve and sixteen. This is a range um, where you will see, which can develop in, in five to 10 years, maybe. If you're a junior company with a 50 million, 100 million market cap, and you're speaking to an investor, and they're saying, well, how are you going to finance this 20,000 ton, 20 year mine life project if it's costing you 20 or $25,000 capital intensity per ton? Investors need to kind of understand the world needs these tons. It's going to be higher cost, capex, higher opex potentially, but nevertheless, it's still going to be a very economic project and they, they should be one, funding them and two, pricing uh, the, the equity in the market at an appropriate valuation to get it funded? I think we have to see this from the perspective of the end user, so the OEMs. They must pull out, whatever it costs, electric cars in order to avoid penalties when not matching certain environmental standards. Emissions It's going to cost them money, at least in Europe. The question is how much that is. If you have a plan to, to turn out by 2025, like a million cars or two million cars or whatever, you have to make sure you get your material. And what happens is that uh, the car industry is putting tens of billions into developing new models, which are the first ones going to hit the market 2020. Their suppliers, the battery guys, are setting up a gigafactory after gigafactory and, and, uh, uh, and increasing the numbers. And we are talking about whether it's, it makes sense to invest or not in resources. Um, at the end of the day, the, these numbers have to match somewhat. I think there is a bit of a disconnect. Currently, there is not enough investment. And considering the timelines, you need to start now. We are very privileged to have today Tim McKenna, a very longtime Rockwood senior executive uh, who recently has been appointed head of government and investor and public relations for Piedmont Lithium after uh, an 18-month stint in a similar role at Lithium X. Welcome, Tim. Good to be here, Howard. Good to be talking to Rodney as well. Happy St. Patrick's Day, happy Purim, and happy St. Joseph's Day, and anything else that's being celebrated in the New York area. Yeah, th- thanks very much on that. Tim is based in New Jersey, and uh, before we got on the podcast, we were talking about uh, our festivities, both Irish and uh, Purim, and... Uh, and his heritage as part Italian as well. Albemarle is the biggest lithium company in the world. Why don't you just talk about your your background there, the history, when it was Rockwood, when it was owned by KKR, their foray from Chile and then into green bushes in Australia. And uh, we'll start with that and, and continue onwards from there. Uh, Rockwood was started around, I think, 2002 by KKR. KKR bought the specialty chemicals business 
of, I think it was De Goose at the time. In 2004, KKR and, and Safi Gassemi, uh, who was running Rockwood at the time and ran it all through its successful run, and then the uh, company called Shemital, which Shemital was two pieces, lithium, the largest lithium operation in the world, and uh, a surface treatment chemicals business. To Safi's credit, he understood how valuable the lithium business could be. It was fairly obvious just look, from looking at the profit margins that they made. Uh, they had a real lock on the business. Rockwood bought the the business in 2000, I think it was 2004, for about 2 billion euros and significantly increased their revenue from about 1 billion to 3 billion and then proceeded to go public well, in the middle of 2005. That's when they began. Uh, I was with the forest products industry for 25 years prior to that, but that's when they began uh, interviewing me. And shortly after the, the public offering, that's how I joined. So you were there from 2005 uh, IPO time until around 2015 when they sold right, the album? about 10 years. Yeah, back to about 10 years. I've heard fantastic things about Safi Gashemi, and uh, he ended up selling at a very high multiple, 14.4 times EBITDA, EBITDA trailing 12 months, to Luke Kissam and Albemarle. Some people said that uh, Albemarle overpaid for that acquisition at the time, and Albemarle's stock fell for you know about a year or so after that. And, and actually, you, you were the one who told me that actually the, the Rockwood IPO fell um, in 2005 or so. So it took a little while for it to get its feet. But from 20, 2005 to 2015, Rockwood was a very good investment. Um, no, it was. I mean, we, we, went to, we went public at 20. Uh, we dropped pretty precipitously to 2007. To, to 17, excuse me. But then we started to pull back. We pulled back. We pulled back very strongly until 2009. You know, the, the meltdown period, and then uh, and then came back strongly after that. Albemarle uh, had tried around as lithium started to get a lot of attention around. I'd say 2013 or so. Albemarle was announcing that it was going to try to extract. Uh, lithium from some of the brines it used for its bromine operation, and you know it, it it was it was not a successful effort as far as I understand, and that's when uh, uh, Albemarle and Rockwood started to talk. Interesting. So Albemarle tried to get into the lithium business through their Magnolia project in Arkansas, decided it was too difficult, but then proceeded to make a $6.2 billion acquisition of Rockwood, which was at a price of about $85, four times higher than the $20 IPO. And that deal was half cash from Albemarle and half shares. So if you were a shareholder, took your cash, and then held on to your Albemarle shares, which was trading at about you know $70 at the time, you know for three and a half years to February of last year, you would have doubled your money. So overall, uh, a, a good move for anyone involved in the lithium space, both on the Rockwood and Albemarle side. I've been on the record as being an advocate for Albemarle and, and thinking that those who are uh, saying mineral resources might be to you know, an expensive acquisition, just pointing back to what they were saying on Rockwood. So um, I'm optimistic about that. When Rockwood bought uh, the lithium business, we immediately began focusing on promoting the lithium business as the best invest as a tremendous investment and in getting people to understand long term because we at the time Rockwood went public, it had a collection of something like seven uh, unrelated specialty chemical businesses, and it was safety 's plan to to expand lithium and expand one or two of the others and divest of the others, which he which he did over time. By the time he sold uh, Rockwood to Albemarle, it only co consisted of two businesses, surface treatment chemicals and lithium, which had, which had expanded dramatically. Um, at the time, we were in the you know, early, in the 2000s, and uh, when we were in, our, in our, the heart of the business, you know, we had the lowest cost lithium operation in the world in the uh, Solar to Atacama. 
But we understood that we needed more over time. Uh, you know, at the, the, the at, for the entire time that we were at Rockwood, with the exception of the, you know, 2009 global financial meltdown, um, we were we were not quite short of lithium, but had just enough to supply all our customers. And our uh, perspective was always that, you know, we didn't want to play the spot market. We wanted to be the reliable supplier. And we we were working with the uh, Chilean government over time to try to expand our access to lithium. And, and, you know, a big part of my job, besides talking to investors, was to try to try to build up better relations. We thought about possibly reopening the King's Mountain Mine, which Albemarle now owns. We, we got to the point where we knew we could re rely on our uh, brine-based lithium operations. And eventually, though, as history goes, we, uh, we began looking at hard rock, uh, particularly at, uh, at green bushes. And, uh, you know, I would say the Albemarle uh, understands exactly what Rockwood understood, you know, eight, nine years ago, that uh, you're going to need more sources of lithium if you're going to supply uh, the, the kind of battery industry that's in place now. I don't think anybody's going to be able to rely on brine solely, and I don't, I, you know, I, I think the brine-based producers, as much as I was a promoter of brine-based lithium back in the, uh, in, in the day at Rockwood, I think, I think there is just not enough of it uh, short term to uh, and to medium term to uh, to fill global demand. Tim, uh, we'd, we're interested to know a little bit more about the uh, transition of Rockwood out of uh, Chile and into the uh, Western Aust Australian hard rock asset. Can you tell us a bit about that? You know, we were very confident of the value of our lithium assets in the solar to Atacama. And I think from an Albemarle standpoint, still, it's a very good asset. Uh, and we were certainly confident of the, the, the cost structure there. And we had, uh, at the time we started looking at uh, green bushes, we had expanded our uh, operation in the States and we're already starting to expand the operation in Chile, that is expand the La Negra uh, converting plant. Uh, but we, we had been working for some time with the Chilean government uh, to try to get uh, more rights uh, to, to, to uh, uh, use lithium from the desert. Uh, I think most people don't know that actually Rockwood, Albemarle, and its predecessors had actually bought the rights for all of the lithium they were using you know, through the 2000s in the initial deal they made with the Chilean government. They weren't actually paying a royalty. They were paying taxes, but they were not actually paying a royalty. They had paid a, a, a royalty up front. Anyway, we, th those, those uh, uh, discussions with the government stalled for political reasons. We were into a, it, the government was into a very difficult election, which is worth exploring on another podcast, but uh, it was a very difficult election and time. And so, uh, Safi, who's, if nothing, and frankly is one of the better strategists, started to look at green bushes and understood that the, um, the, a, a principal holder of green bushes stock, uh, Taliesin stock, was interested in selling. So, you know, to, to, to make a long story short, we ended up making a bid for Taliesin. Uh, this was in, I think, 2012, and, you know, we had at the time the uh, advice from the best and smartest Australian lawyers and investment bankers that Australia would never let uh, the Chinese out uh, bid us in that, well, lo and behold, uh, <clears throat> within like maybe two days of our uh, bid being finalized, the Chinese came along and outbid us. And I, I'd say to Rockwood and to Safey's credit, we decided not to get into a bidding war with them because it just would have gone on and on. So we, we ended up not buying, but then within probably months, uh, uh, Tianchi and Rockwood were in conversations to, uh, 
to perhaps have Rockwood buy an interest in the uh, the Taliesin operation, the Greenbushes operation, because uh, Tianchi didn't have enough technological expertise, at least that's the way they presented it to us, to to use all of the um, all of the, the lithium that was going to come out of that mine. So we ended up buying a uh, 49 point something percent interest in green bushes and uh, you know and that's that's and that diversified our supply and we began to talk about a number of other things that we might do to use that material, as everyone knows who's following lithium now, the great advantage of coming out of spodumene is that you can go directly from spodumene to uh, lithium hydroxide. If you're going from brine, as again, most people know these days, you have to go from brine to carbonate and then to hydroxide. So if you have a good supply of spodumene, which certainly green bushes has, in Western Australia, you've got you can produce uh, lithium hydroxide uh, for a very economical price. And then the you know the the other thing that Rockwood understood, uh, you know Rockwood was Rockwood's lithium operation was was two pieces. It was a, a company called Foot Minerals, uh, which started the Kings Mountain mine and once back in the 50s was the you know, major producer of the world's lithium. And then it was a company called Shemital, which ultimately became the name of the business, which was a, a processor of lithium and frankly wrote the book uh, on uh, how to, you know, how to process lithium, what to do with it. They, I, I, I have a, still have a copy of that little book, which they used to sell to people. But uh, they certainly understood at the time uh, these German scientists that lithium hydroxide was going to be the preferred uh, chemical for the kind of big batteries that Tesla and all produces. So that's that's basically the history of how Rockwood got into uh, into that uh, into that deal. And then within obviously within a year of us buying that, uh, you know, Albemarle was in talks, which ultimately led uh, led to uh, the deal of Albemarle buying Rockwood. And then, if we uh, shift across to uh, to the states, uh, can you speak a little about uh, Silver Peak, some of the other operations? You know, in two thousand nine, uh, the Obama administration comes along with uh, the what they called the American Relief and Recovery Act, something like that, which included a lot of support for supposedly shovel-ready projects uh, to try to kickstart the economy, and one of those. Uh, of those grants was money for uh, alternative energy projects, basically, or alternative energy materials. And so we applied, Rockwood applied for a grant uh, to, uh, to basically redo the, the wells in Silver Peak, as well as build a, a, a renewed lithium hydroxide plant in uh, Kings Mountain. And, uh, you know, we were very successful. We got a uh, $28 million grant. It was a matching grant. You had to spend an equal amount. We redid the pond system and wells in Silver Peak and then built what's now, uh, you know, a very good lithium hydroxide plant in Kings Mountain. We're looking at, uh, you know, we're chatting across uh, to the various participants in the industry, and the consensus continues to be that there is a lack of investment in lithium, in lithium, you know, upstream and and downstream, and that the OEMs for all the targets and the expectations that they're having, they're not going to be reached. So, you deal quite a bit in government relations. It would be good to get an idea of how seriously you know Capitol Hill is looking at this. You know, the thoughts on on safe and. Uh, and whether or not you know the necessary changes are going to be made in order to achieve uh, all these grand targets that are being put out there. In the sort of mid 2000s, let's say 2007 time period, we were doing our best to educate legislators about what lithium actually was and what the potential was for electric vehicles, and we had gotten very active 
in an organization called Securing America's Future Energy, which is still riding very strong in Washington. It's probably the lead advocacy group in Washington that advocates for secure, reliable, affordable, clean supplies of energy. Um, and it, you know, it, it takes the position that, you know, we fight wars around the world uh, and get into all sorts of trouble just to keep the oil flowing. And, you know, we need to look, and I mean, I believe this as a citizen, we need to look long term at, you know, how are we going to supply energy for all of the things we use? And one very simple way to reduce the use of petroleum products and, and use energy more efficiently is to go to electric vehicles. And I think it's, it's becoming evident with what the auto industry is doing, what Tesla has done, what Audi is doing, BMW, and so on and so on, that, uh, that the, the industry is gonna, gonna slowly but surely gravitate to more electric drive technology. And this is, this is not really as much a clean air thing as it's just, it takes you know, something like one sixth the energy to, to move a car by electricity as it does to move with an internal combustion engine. So we've been heavily involved in that kind of advocacy as long as, as, and really giving the same message to the investment community. And in, in today's you know, modern times, we've got uh, Simon Moores from Benchmark Minerals testifying in front of Senate committees, et cetera. Is, do you think uh, that... Uh, that the powers that be are going to listen and realize uh, the uh, the position they're in regarding you know battery, you know energy vehicle battery metals. Well, I think I think they are starting to understand. I mean, certainly the hearing that you refer to, where Simon Moore's uh, spoke before the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Uh, first of all, that committee is one of the few functioning, well functioning committees in Washington uh, with a good bar bipartisan group of people. The senior uh, member uh, is uh, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, who of course is a friend to the petroleum industry, but actually a very independent woman. Uh, it's, it, you know, people need to remember that uh, she, a very right of center uh, candidate knocked her out of the nomination uh, in the last time she ran for office and she ran as an independent and still managed to win. Uh, Joe Manchin, the uh, Democrat from West Virginia, is the uh, ranking minority member on the committee, and and they they are you know they are very very focused on real energy issues because they represent energy states. So they're starting to understand, and in my discussions with various legislators who represent North Carolina, they understand there is a real opportunity here. And, and certainly the legislators who represent the Southeast as well as the Midwest understand that the auto industry, a crucial point where it really, it needs to maintain its competitiveness. I've been talking with people in the State Department on China policy who understand that if the United States does not start to get more active in this area, you know, China, which has been buying up as much lithium as it possibly can, you know, will control that supply and critically uh, threatens to control the supply chain, which I think is the real, real uh, issue here for the Americans. I could, uh, if I could just chime in there, because I've had a number of um, conversations for much of last year. I, I was very outwardly and vocally uh, trying to get attention to the, the, the Tangxi SQM, uh, what I consider uh, China nationalization of uh, the people's lithium of Chile and uh, to, to no avail uh, from a, a U.S. perspective because I saw, you know, SQM as an NYSE-listed company and Nutrien as an NYSE-listed company. You know, there could be some jurisdiction there. But um, apart from Senator Manchin and Murkowski, I understand the State Department uh, is very much a, a increasingly attuned to this uh, consideration of China's uh, um, encroachment on on the world's battery materials, and uh, alongside that, I understand there are some interagency 
discussions. Uh, Mike Pence gave a, a speech last year, and the Department of Defense uh, put out an industrial policy last year hi- highlighting 300 strategic vulnerabilities in America, of which military batteries was one. So, uh, you know, the lithium business in America, I think, started in North Carolina as part of the um, Manhattan Project, as uh, Garrett Fueling uh, called it, but basically uh, um, for the hydrogen bomb, uh, lithium was was necessary. So that spawned, like so many things, something starts with the military and then the civilian applications kind of take over. So the, the hydrogen bomb application may have been maybe 10% of it, but it, it spawned you know North Carolina's dominance for you know some 40 years in in the lithium sure. industry and uh, so it, it's good to like from simon moore's first visit 15 months ago to this second one to now the state department and other arms of the u.s government you know recognizing that, that there's there's movement there at the same time you see you know donald trump tweeting today to you know after having a conversation with mary barra to you know reopen the lordstown ohio plant and he hasn't been a, a huge fan of the overall uh, EV thematic, or he's more been pro coal. At the same time, uh, you have states like California and New York and others, um, you know, just going ahead with you know the, the, the more majority, you know, European, you know, global sentiment toward this. So. Um, if we could just conclude, I believe uh, some sort of a trade uh, deal is relatively imminent. Uh, it's in both China and Trump's interest you know, politically to to do that. But do you have any read on the electric car and, and the battery well, storage I, business? The organization SAFE that I mentioned has a very strong backing by retired generals and people in the Defense Department who understand that Energy is the, you know, it's really the foundation of any modern economy, any industrial economy. And so they're very concerned and and their supporters are very concerned about secure, again, secure, reliable, um, clean supplies, sustainable supplies of energy. And, and that includes alternative energy. The, uh, the best that I understand from the State Department as well as others in the Department of Defense, is what they're looking to do uh, is to try to see if there are partnerships we can make with other countries outside of China, whether it be Canada, Chile, Argentina, Eastern European countries that have access to all of the various materials that might be used in a battery or in an alternative energy application and see if we can do something to try to support their efforts, make, make you know, partnership efforts that would allow other, other parts of the supply chain to grow. The final point is that most people in Washington understand that there are, there are tons of tax preferences and tax expenditures that are given to industries all across the board. The energy industry, the oil industry, is a very big beneficiary, as is the agricultural industry. Those people who say we shouldn't give any money to industry, they're kind of missing the point because money already does go to industry. In an ideal world, we would have everything, you know, those of us who favor free enterprise would have, you know, everything go, uh, you know, through the free enterprise system. But that's not the way, you know, our modern, modern government works. It's not the way that Europe works, and it sure as hell isn't the way China works. What we need is sensible policies. What we need, you know, is a, instead of trying to attack these things when there's a crisis, is, and this is what SAFE's activity is, and this is what people like Simon Moore's advocate, and this is what the Energy, uh, Senate Energy Committee thinks of, is let's look at long-term policies that would under, underpin, you know, a sound uh, energy economy. That's great. Thank you very much, Tim. I uh, will be looking forward to your bringing me some corned beef and cabbage, and uh, in return, <laughs> I'll bring you some hamantashen. Uh, that's great. And uh, by the way, I'm sure in uh, where you are in Queens, there's probably some nice uh, 
uh, Italian bakery that will have something for St. Joseph's Day tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, they, they have terrific pastry. If you're in good shape, uh, your waistline can handle handle them. So. Uh, they, they certainly do. One of my favorite lines in one of the Godfather movies was uh, after one of their hits, uh, I forget which one, who said, like, don't forget the cannolis in the car. Yeah, well, it was... It was it, it, the famous line is, uh, leave the gun, take the cannolis. <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot, Tim. Take care. Lithium Ion Rocks, Lithium Ion Bull, and through our respective LinkedIn and Twitter posts, Rodney and I may share with our audience some rationale for a stock for which we have conviction to own or not to own. If you agree or disagree with and act on or against the rationale of anything said or written in this or any other lithium-ion rocks or lithium-ion bull, that's your free choice. But to be clear, what you are listening to or reading is not investment advice and may not be unbiased. It should not be construed as an investment recommendation to buy or sell any security. Rodney and I are not registered investment advisors nor broker-dealers. Please visit libull.com for further disclaimers.